Hello, everyone, and welcome to an exciting, postmodern, experimental new installment of Club Moffat Talks. I am your uh, very confused host, Chris, instruction librarian. Got to add in that part. Yes. And I'm Joseph, and I am also an instruction librarian. And I'm someone there who's never been here before, so I'm just confused about what's going on. No, I'm Ryan Samuelson, back in the seat again. Um, unfortunately, Allison is no longer with us, so she will no longer be part of the uh, podcast. Allison moved. She's having a great life, just in case anyone's confused by that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 our lives are worse off because she's not here, though. True. And we are joined today by Dr. Peter Fields. Um. You were talking about Allison Breen. Uh, no, Allison. Which which Allison are we? Allison about? Atherton, our uh, our marketing and outreach. Oh, coordinator. oh, really? Uh, she moved. She's she's off in uh, Colorado, living her best life. Oh, for heaven's sakes! Yeah. Oh my! Oh wow! <laughs> okay, things change so rapidly and yeah. dramatically. Yeah, libraries known for their uh, hair like pace. Well, if we want to get into this at some point. Your department's gone through a lot of changes this summer as well, Peter. We might want to talk about that at some point. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm uh, Peter Fields, uh, associate professor of of English, and um, uh, we have an interim chair in English. Uh, that's Sally Henschel. If you do, uh, do you know her, Sally? Yes, Sally Henschel. Sally yes, we speak in quite often. Yes, she's also the the graduate, the English graduate coordinator. So she really has a lot on her plate right now. And, um, but uh, I'm really excited about her being our chair. Uh, and uh, I think we have a real good team in our little program, uh, English, Humanities and Philosophy. I'm, I'm speaking of our, our secretary, uh, Pam Marshall, and I'm talking about Dottie Westbrook downstairs, who is the advisor for PY. And I guess I'm getting into the weeds here, but uh, okay. I do think of them as a team. The weeds are where we generally remain here, so you're in good company. Uh, so usually at this point, uh, it's been a month. We've had some time to enjoy ourselves, I think. Uh, anyone want to talk about their recent interests or obsessions, I suppose? Um, I binge watched the three new seasons of the, of I guess, the reboot of Law & Order this, this weekend. It's a reboot? Well, they, they've been off the air for, what, 12, 14 years? And now they're back. The original Law & Order. Oh, okay. The original is what you're watching. Oh. The original. Oh. And, well, here's my here's my thoughts on it. Um, It's always been a heavy-handed show, but they're really heavy-handed now. I mean, like, every single en episode ends with, like, a, a uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a fable. It ends with a lesson plan at the end of it about what you're supposed to have learned. Also, um, another thing that bothered me watching these back to back is they have a stunt team. And so they have to give the stunt team something to do every single episode, which is also kind of tiring to watch because there's always someone who runs. There's always someone who runs from the police in every single episode. Uh, but anyway, that's what I watched. Uh, the only other thing I've got going on is I think it was yesterday or the day before the trailer for the new Saturday Night Live biopic by Jason Reichman dropped, and that looks really interesting. Huh. Oh, That's I what I got. Oh, I didn't hear about this. Which biopic? I'm sorry. Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. It's about it's about oh. the original first broadcast of the first episode. Ooh. And how much of a how much of a, a of the fact that it they had no idea if it was going to be a success, and it was a bunch of 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 basically drunken and inebriated 20 year olds um just acting crazy and not ready for prime time uh, yeah that uh, yeah that expresses it quite well yeah. and it's, again it's, what's interesting is it's jason reichman his dad is uh, was is uh, ivan reichman who has a lot of experience working with the saturday night live alumni so he's grew up with these people too so it, was, it looks it looks very interesting. The cast looks great. They're all young actors. There's there's very few actors that are that are really well known. There's a few here and there, but it looks like a really good cast of actors as well for it. So, what always interests me about stuff like that is like SNL is like 
beyond mainstream now. It's like yeah. it's gone past the point where like the the mainstream audience watches that. And Fifty it's like, years ah, or or, or yeah. forty nine years, I guess. Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, almost almost five decades worth of stuff. I mean, I watched it when I was uh, when I was way too young to be watching it, and they were already arguably past their prime time. But thinking about that, and uh, like I'm watching The Simpsons right now. And The Simpsons is so far beyond its prime. Like, where that stuff, uh, like SNL and The Simpsons in particular, were both like, like this, this renegade type of media that was so, so, um, not perverse per se, but, uh, it basically transcended its its own media. It was subversive. Subversive. The original SNL and the original uh, The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, not politically correct. Extraordinarily subversive. And now you look at it and it's so tame. And stuff like South Park almost is so tame in, in comparison to what we see like just on average now. So I'm interested in seeing a, a, a biopic about old SNL and, and seeing how they contextualize that, honestly. Well, the biggest name actor, I forget his name, but it, Nicholas, he's on Succession. Um, but he uh, he's playing both um, Jim Henson and um, Andy Kaufman. Oh, okay. And it just they have a, a brief part of him doing Jim Henson, and it's just hilarious. It made me break up during the trailer. He's just like, the writers on the fourteenth level uh, took Big Bird and hung him from my dressing room, from my dressing room door. Do you have a title <laughs> for this? What? Do you have a title for the movie? It's Saturday Night. Okay. Great. Yeah. I'm just saying, if you haven't seen the trailer yet, watch the trailer. It, it looks very interesting. Um, I wasn't really interested in it, but I, after watching the trailer, like I need to watch that. That looks like it's going to be really good. I'm interested to see how much clap back, how much push there'll be from the surviving actors of that mm. original cast. Well, Chevy Chase will probably complain because he complains about any anybody who who well, shows sure. how he is and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Although he said that I was reading a, a thing from that he did in something like variety or or some some one of the one of the big uh, magazines and he said he interviewed 30 people from who were still yeah. alive from back then stuff like that for to do it and Lorraine Newman was one of them and you know, mm -hmm. so you got a lot of information from her about it yeah. um also uh um he wasn't part of the first season he came on after Chevy Chase left who am I thinking of um Murphy uh Murray uh Bill Murray Bill Murray, Bill Murray. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, you know, if you have a big leather bag of money, you can get him to give his opinion about anything. But one of the things he did is he talked to Bill Murray about because Bill Murray wasn't represented in at all in the in the movie in in, in the TV show because he wasn't part of the cast yet. And he was like, "Yeah, you've got you've got everything spot on as far as as far as um, representation of how people are." So cool. That yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's what I'm throwing out there. Um, I have been watching some TV. I've, I have found, uh, I, I found an old British TV show called Marcella, uh, starring Anna Friel, uh, which was just weird. Um, <laughs> she's, she has, the character has blackouts and then wakes wakes up in places not knowing what she did or how she got there. Uh, and she's a police officer. So sometimes she'll end up investigating things that she realizes she might have been involved in. You know, just a weird little. I think I, I, I think I've seen some episodes of this in yeah. the first season. Yeah. Um, it, it, interesting, but but very strange. Um, I watched the uh, new final season for Umbrella Academy. Oh, you did? I, I, I watched that. I found it overall disappointing. Oh. Um, I, I, I think that if you haven't watched any of this new season yet, just just don't. <laughs> um, really? If you were... If you were any kind of happy with the way the third season ended just just don't watch any of this fourth season it is a shorter season it is only six episodes 
but I feel like they did a disservice to about half of the characters. Uh, I I can't recommend it. Um, and I I mean I enjoyed the original source material and I I enjoyed the earlier seasons, but but not this one. Um, I did see the new Deadpool Wolverine movie, which was just exactly what I thought it would be. Um, yeah, and I'm doing my regular reading. Uh, uh, Athena and I are doing the uh, Wheel of Time series, uh, and I read a graphic novel that Ryan had recommended to me, which I thought was interesting, but not necessarily good. Mm. Um, <laughs> which one? Which one? Which one? The, the FF. You, we 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 talked about it. It's that I kind of told first... you that afterwards. The fact too, I was like, I I, I recommended it to you, and then I reread it myself. And I'm kind of like, uh, maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I did think it was interesting, but it wasn't interesting enough to make me really want to get the next volume. Gotcha. Uh, for me personally, uh, but it's I it's Hickman who comes up with really great ideas, but he's not the best plotter. It was, like, yeah. His plots aren't that strong. He has yeah. really cool ideas, but not really good. Um, good uh, good plots. Jonathan Hickman again, brilliant idea person, but not really great as far as as the actual follow through. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. So, what about you guys? What have you been reading, watching, doing? You want to go first? You 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 had something written down that I actually wanted to talk about. So, you want to go first? Well, um, I've been rereading uh, the stories in Stephen King's most recent book. You liked it darker. Yeah, twenty twenty four, his most recent, uh, most recent publication, and these are stories that have not been previously published, and. Uh, and rereading them is revelatory. I read them first very quickly just to see what was there. And then I, I went back and, uh, and the second read uh, was very useful. I felt like, you know, I, I'm, I'm appreciating this. And I began to feel, wow, uh, in some ways, this may be one of his most significant books. Um, I'm also um, uh, rereading uh, a book by Elijah Wald from 2015, Dylan Goes Electric. Uh, from 2015, I understand uh, from a Forbes article I read on my phone that uh, Elijah Wald's book, Dylan Goes Electric, is the basis for the biopic, the Bob Dylan biopic, uh, coming out in December, I believe. Again, I'm not... Uh, exactly sure. Um, but um, I, I read Elijah Wald's book some years ago, pre-COVID, uh, and, and I was rereading it uh, to get a feel for why this book, of the many books of Bob Dylan, uh, including from those that pertain to his early period, why this one? And I, I think it's a real interesting book because of the subtitle, the subtitle conveys uh, some important information. Uh, Dylan Goes Electric, Newport, Seeger, Dylan, and the Night That Split the 60s. And the book does a very interesting uh, comparison between Pete Seeger and Bob Dylan. It goes back and forth between them as two ways of understanding the 60s. And in a way, there's something chronological there. The early 60s belong to Pete Seeger, according to this book, Okay, and Dylan owns the later '60s, uh, uh, or we might, or we might say the early '60s are Pete Seeger. The mid '60s would be Bob Dylan. Um, uh, Bob Dylan disappears out of the limelight in 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 the summer of '66. So um, it's interesting the 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 book that may be the basis of this movie because it's as much about uh, Pete Seeger as it is Bob Dylan, which makes it an interesting choice, a, a surprising choice. Uh, uh, the film the is a, the biopic. The film's name is A Complete Unknown. Uh, yeah, Timothy complete Chalamet unknown. is playing Bob Dylan, and Edward yeah, Norton is Chalamet. playing Pete Seeger. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, Edward Norton is playing Pete Seeger. Oh, well, that, wow. that, that that's interesting. That's fun. Uh, 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 Dylan fans tend to love Pete Seeger, and Pete Seeger fans 
I don't know if they love Dylan. Uh, so I, 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 I really can't speak, uh, cannot speak for Pete Seeger fans, but Pete Seeger is a beloved figure uh, for a lot, uh, a, a lot of people and their preferred way of understanding the 60s. I'm not, I'm not familiar with Pete Seeger, actually, but I, I saw the trailer for this film and uh, yeah, it just it just seems like a like perfectly cast and just it, it looks phenomenal. But do you think maybe it's a recency bias? That's why they might pick uh, a book like that. Maybe it's not just because it's more significant than another um, than another biography. It might not be because it has better information. It's just just recency bias. It's just a newer work. It might be more familiar with people. Well, um, there are countless books about Bob Dylan. Yeah. Uh, there's even a book called Another Book About yeah. Bob Dylan, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there have been plenty of books recently, uh, plenty of. Uh, and it is, a, it is an interesting choice. Its subject matter is so sp specific with its focus on the Newport Newport Folk Festivals, 1959, okay, and then 1960, and then there's a there's a skip. There, there were no Newport Folk Festivals in 61 and 62, but then they renew in 63, 64, and the Dylan Goes Electric Newport Folk Festival is the summer of 65. Just the way I'm framing uh, the material in terms of Newport Folk Festivals uh, tells, you know, conveys something important there that this movie is, um, this movie is, wants us to think about the 60s and what the 60s mean and use Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger, respectively, iconic figures in, in their own right, as ways of thinking about what the 60s means. For, for instance, with Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger uh, was somebody who really did live his philosophy. Uh, he was, you know, very much a uh, Marxist, very much somebody who believed in the working people, uh, unabashedly a communist, uh, and uh, investigated by the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Uh, um, you know, he, very controversial figure, uh, but not a bomb thrower, always somebody who wanted to advance other people and would talk about other people, not to name names, okay, but to to raise them above himself. And he always wanted to see himself as part of a group. And for him, uh, when he got involved in the Newport Folk Festivals, uh, which began in 1959, uh, he really wanted them to be about discovering rural talent, talent that people weren't aware of, uh, styles of folk music and the blues, okay, that would not otherwise have an audience. And of course, bring in the more uh, the, the more successful people uh, who who might have a reputation and uh, and they could anchor it. But it, it it was really a workshop opportunity. And throughout the day during the festival, they would have workshops, and it was an opportunity for uh, an audience familiar with some some people in folk music could become acquainted with uh, all kinds of artists from all over the country who otherwise would not have an audience. And so that really is one way of thinking about the 60s. The 60s was, uh, was about people working together. Uh, for lack of a better term, the workshop 60s. The 60s, you know, where people come together in a spirit that it's egalitarian and really respects differences and appreciates differences, but within a collective vision that vision privileging the worker, the laborer, you know, very much a left-leaning cause. Uh, then in the, but then there's Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan in this book is contrasted with Pete Seeger. Bob Dylan is the iconoclast. Um, it's very hard to understand him, and he was somebody, uh, according to Elijah Wald, he, uh, well, and this is confirmed throughout uh, the D Dylan biographies, uh, somebody very hard to, to contextualize within a group. 
uh, if there was anybody who was not a workshop type person, it was Bob Dylan. And uh, and so we have two visions. We have Dylan, the iconoclast, the person who breaks with any kind of group identity, okay, and whose ideology is in the wind. His signature song in this book is Blowing in the Wind. And we see that we remember that song as being a part of of uh, the protest movement that 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 song uh, for many people captured the the spirit of changing times it captured the the longing of a new generation for something more uh, uh, it captured the spirit of what was happening in the south voter registration drives and and uh, pushing back against Jim Crow and segregation. But the song itself, Blowing in the Wind, the answer is Blowing in the Wind, typified Dylan's inability, this is again the point of view of the book, his, his disinclination to come to one answer. He, 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 for him, if he were in a conversation, he would find fault with everybody's position, and he would, and uh, he, and for when he says the uh, the answer is blowing in the wind, uh, Elijah Wald cites a, a song that he wrote prior to that, just prior to that, where in the song he's arguing with people who feel they have the answer, and he feels the answer is in the wind, and then Dylan uses apparently that inspired Dylan to write another song where the refrain actually was blowing in the wind and it's inconclusive. It, 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 if, if we take it from Bob Dylan's point of view, it's the most ironic choice for an anthem because it doesn't take a clear position. It also reminds me of kind of the, the theme of uh, uh, what, what the film is, is titled after. Um, oh, no, I just had the name. Uh, uh, the times are, the times are a change um, where the I, the theme of the song is it doesn't really matter if you want to keep the status quo or if you have an idea for like um, I don't want to say a very conservative view of the world but like if if you think that tradition is the way the world is going to remain you're completely wrong because the times are going to keep changing they're going to they're going to pass you by and it's going to be whoever is the voice of the next generation they're going to be the ones that define the way the culture kind of moves so to have that juxtaposed with the song you're talking about it kind of makes it kind of almost seems like there is a, a motif with with dylan's music even from that early yeah the, the times they are changing uh it is is an interesting song in this discussion uh, because it seems to be taking a position, doesn't it? It, it, it? it seems to be taking a youth generation, a new generation, you know, uh, a kind of point of view. Um, and for some people, that's what the 60s are about. It's the young generation, and they have something to say. And I just paraphrased the Monkees theme song, okay, from 1966. Okay, we're the new it's generation. It's all related. It's, it's all. We've it's got all, something all, to say. It's all tied together. Okay, uh, uh, but if but again, you know, I think you make a good point, Chris. If we listen to that song, the the, the song is apocalyptic. We have it. We have change that is affecting everybody, and whoever thinks they're going to be first are probably going to be last. To paraphrase the the song. As I was saying that, I also got to thinking. It's almost um, it, it's optimistic, but it almost feels defeatist in the way that it's like it the next generation will then like the generation coming up who make who who make the times change they're going to be the ones coming up who then have to let the next generation come along and they're going to be the ones who are the ones who change the the culture and the times and the ones after that are going to be so it's almost like this cycle where it's like you just just listen to like the way the wind blows basically the um Another interesting fact about this book, interesting perspective that it has, is that it puts a big emphasis. In fact, it's the dead center of the book. It's about 300 pages, and about the 148 mark, it talks about his speech. It paraphrases and quotes from Bob Dylan's speech at this awards dinner. 
he he received an award called the Tom Paine Award from uh, the ECLC. I'm not. I'm, I'm probably not getting that acronym right, but a civil lib a, a civil uh, liberties group. Okay, that wanted every year to acknowledge somebody who was making a difference in the civil rights struggle. And so the Tom Paine Award, that would seem like a perfect award in uh, circa 1963 uh, for, for Bob Dylan. Now, it's just after the assassination of John Kennedy that he was presented with this award. And I've always I've, Oh, I've, had, I've been always so ambivalent about the Tom Paine Award and that speech. Uh, it is painful to to read about that speech and read about that moment in uh, Bob Dylan's life. Uh, in that speech, he says he identifies with Lee Harvey Oswald. He and he says, "I can really imagine what it's like, you know, to be Lee Harvey Oswald." <laughs> uh, in other words. He had been drinking, and he was used to people not contradicting him. Uh, uh, he, he was used to people disrespectfully listening to him in, in the circles he had been in. And here he comes right out, and this is an old, uh, uh, for him, it was not anything new for him to say this. But he said, you know, I identify with, with people that, uh, that, other people may vilify. I find myself in their shoes. I can imagine being them. I can imagine, I can imagine Lee Harvey Oswald and whatever emotions and feelings would have driven him to do to do what he did. And of course, of course, he's receiving the Tom Paine Award. It would seem very counterintuitive to give the award to somebody like that. Uh, he also said things like. Uh, he said things to this effect. And by the way, as I look around this room, I see people who are old, who are middle aged. I don't like you. <laughs> I am tired of seeing people who don't have much hair on their heads. Uh, I would like to see more people with more hair on their heads. Just, you know, not telling, just saying. And, and that was the tenor of this speech where Basically, he dismissed his audience, uh, rebuked them, made fun of them, and then spoke, it would seem, it would seem anyway, in a way that was, well, as if he were excusing Lee Harvey Oswald, as if, as if he could see some legitimate reason for any of his, uh, for, for what he did. And... The uh, and of course the, the the group was outraged. Okay, and he looked back on this speech with tremendous embarrassment. Yeah, if there's one, I, I tell you right now, Bob Dylan's not going to watch this movie, uh, especially especially if it's confirmed that it's based on these events. And it's again the choice of this book. Uh, to to me, I, I just. Of all the books, there, there's a great book came out in 1971 called Dillard. And it's by Anthony Scudetto. And it has a lot of awkward moments in it, too. Uh, but it's not so focused on what I consider some of the most painful events of, of Bob Dylan's early, early experience with public life and being a celebrity. Well, that, that's almost his entire life, though, is just just the public kind of eludes him like the, the limelight is just like he's never been much of a public figure, it seems like, but or a very openly public figure, rather. Well, I, I but I don't want to neglect Stephen King's uh, most recent book. I I, uh, I, I know uh, uh, I know, Ryan, you, your father's a big, a big Stephen King fan. I bet he's read this book. No, he is not. Um, my dad is at the point where he has dementia and he has problems thinking. He doesn't read anymore because oh. he can't remember where he left off. He doesn't remember anything uh, from what he read prior. So he does not, unfortunately, read anymore. I have not gotten him a Stephen King book for probably five, six years now. Well, I, uh, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, it, it's a it's it's a book that um, rereading. Uh, 
has been revelatory. I keep coming back to that word revelatory. I think it's an important Stephen King book, and it's a it's a good book for getting an idea of what we're going to be talking about in the decades to come after Stephen King passes away. Uh, he is, I think, 76. You know, there's going to come a day when he passes away, and we're going to be talking about him. And I think already um, this collection of stories gives us an intimation of the kinds of issues that people are going are going to want to address. Um, uh, I think uh, I think the interview he gave a brief interview, uh, I forget with whom. And the interviewer, this this was a few months ago, the interviewer asked on the basis of this book, do you believe in fate? F-A-T-E, do you believe in fate? And Stephen King said, I, I have a hard time answering that. I don't know if I can answer that question in any kind of satisfying way. And I thought that was a really interesting response. And, and after reading and rereading these stories, I really feel like, wow, one of his topics is the idea of fate um, and destiny. Is, is there some kind of dynamic in the universe uh, that predetermines uh, outcomes? Uh, I think that's part of what he's doing, but he, he, he's, uh, he's doing a lot of things, uh, a lot of things related to, um, uh, to belief what we believe and why we believe things. He's very interested in that. Uh, he's trying to say a lot of important things uh, in these stories. And uh, if, if, if nothing else, if nothing else, uh, there, there's a, a wonderful story in there. It's really a novella, Danny Coughlin's dream. And it's a, it, it's an interesting, what if, OK, uh, Danny Coughlin has a dream, OK, of a of a buried body. OK, now, if you have a dream that's really vivid and in that dream. There you you learn the location of a murder victim. This if this story is your guide, keep it to yourself. <laughs> Don't do not tell anybody and he and and in and of course he calls the police and voila yes you guessed it he becomes the chief suspect okay for the murder of that person and uh and the the detective the police detective who's pursuing him is an interesting person uh, uh in a sense the villain uh he's somebody who's an uh who who uh who has a uh a, a disease called arrhythmia, and he what he does is he must add, he must constantly find numbers in all his experiences and add them together. And so, if if Danny's having a conversation with him, he he would say, "Why can't you, for in, for instance, why can't you believe that I could be innocent and that I'm telling him the truth?" And he would say, and he would say, "Well, I just think you want publicity." Five, three, two, one. You know that you know that that's the way he talks. That's the way he thinks. Uh, when the 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 detective is not actively engaged in investigation, he goes back to his hotel room and he counts everything in the hotel room and he sets up extra chairs. He borrows folding chairs and he moves from folding chair to folding chair. And each folding chair represents a multiplication. He he counts. He he multiplies uh, everything he's counted. You know. It, you know, and of course, uh, I I wondered at first, what is this character all about? Why is he in this story? Uh, in the acknowledgement, Stephen King says that, um, in his acknowledgments, he says, I usually have a strong idea of what the story is going to be about, to the point that I see whole paragraphs of how the story is going to start. But this particular detective who's pursuing poor Danny Coughlin, okay, uh, he, uh, he, he came out of the blue. Stephen King said, I did not anticipate this character. He just sort of developed in the story as it unfolded. 
And I and I and I thought to myself, I thought in many ways, this is a story about faith. Um, the, the detective who's working, working with the math obsessive detective, uh, that that detective eventually realizes that there's a problem and that the case is unfair and that the pursuit of Danny is unfair. And and she apologizes. I, I don't want to give away spoilers, but she she apologizes and 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 uh, Danny says, "Well, you know, believing is hard, isn't it? Believing is hard." And that's sort of the bumper sticker for this story. And and it occurred to me, I was writing notes in my book. My note, my book is filled with notes. And in the, in re response to this story. Uh, uh, I, I was I wrote to this effect. Um, modern people, that's what we're talking. We're talking about modern people who have difficulty believing. We have we we it's we have difficult difficulty believing things that really matter. We'll believe conspiracy theories and we'll believe rumors. But in terms of believing something really profound about the nature of the universe, we're, we're almost incapable of it. Believing is very hard. So what do we do instead? How do we fill that hole where faith might have been? With neurosis. <laughs> we, we fill it with neurosis. Five, three, two. Okay. Times seven is 14. So did this just five for, uh... That's in, in other words, that's Stephen King's take on modern people. And you said this just came out, or yeah, twenty twenty four. Yes, I, I haven't read a new Stephen King thing in probably ever. I think I, I don't think I've read anything from him since I was since after the date I was born, maybe. But I could be wrong about that one. But um, I I like a good Stephen King story. Well, th these are among the best ever. Um, I was a Stephen King fan early on, um, and uh, I remember uh, reading um, uh, The Shining when it came out, okay, uh, and that's what, 77, 1977? Wow, yeah. That's how old I am. So uh, um, I, I would say that uh, there is so much here uh, for people to talk about. Uh, in terms of things that matter. Uh, it's not sensational. Now, it does have a kind of rhythm to it that's familiar to us. For those of us who read Stephen King, uh, there, there are some familiar features. Uh, uh, Stephen King's characters speak colloquially. They, 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 are, they are very colloquial and vulgarities. Vulgarities. Uh, I, I note them it, when I, in the margins. Vulgarity. I'll, I'll write it. Okay, uh, Stevie. Uh, honest to goodness, Stephen King vulgarity. And there are stories where that's muted. Uh, there's the last story in the book, and I think it's the last story in the book on purpose, so that it could be the last story ever published while he's alive. That could very well be. It's called The Answer Man. And uh, and it took a while for a vulgarity to show up, but it but it did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it did. Uh, um, and th these are the kind of vulgarities that we think, you know, the things that we think or we say, okay, if we don't realize, if, if we don't think anybody's listening, or we might say it only in the presence of a close friend, uh, you know, and so there, there are a lot of familiar features, but just to compare this book, for instance, um, with with early King's sh short stories, uh, the, the, these are stories that, to, for lack of a better term, are more complete in that their their significance, their significance is there. The uh, the the reason these stories exist and what higher purpose they speak to, it's included. These are not stories uh, written for their emotional effect. Uh, sometimes I wonder with Stephen King. Uh, is, is he like Edgar Allan Poe? Just according to according to Edgar Allan Poe, he was just going for an emotional effect. Everything was organized, completion backwards to achieve an emotional effect. And, and sometimes I wonder, well, is Stephen King as a horror writer basically doing the same? In in this case, no. 
I mean, the, the, these stories are not measured for their effect. They're measured for what he wants to say. Uh, real quick, Peter, since we're talking about the latest of Stephen King's um, um, stories, I want to talk a little about his first story, the one that went unpublished until about 10 years later. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, isn't this your father's favorite story? It's my favorite story as well. Oh, okay. And I'm talking about The Long Walk, his Vietnam protest song he wrote when he was in college. If you didn't know, Peter, it is um, being turned into a film. And they're wrapping wow. up production this month. Wow. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. It's been years people have been trying to make this into a film. And it just hasn't happened. George Romero was associated with it for the longest time, but it never came about. So I would um, think it would be difficult. Who's attached to this? I, you can do it for a small budget, though, Peter. It's just a bunch of kids walking down a road. I mean. Um, On Netflix, there is a there is now a. Oh, a lot of little movies, uh, movies that are 15. Yeah, I see Joseph nodding his head. He knows what I mean. Movies that really look exciting. And then I realized they're 14 minutes or they're mm. 17 minutes. They're only well, 20 I, minutes, something like I that. I say it's the first film that's ever been done. But one of the things Stephen King has done for years now is he's told um, student filmmakers, you can absolutely adapt any of my works that you want to adapt. And I will not, I will not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, force my uh my copyright upon you whatsoever so if you want to adapt any story i've ever done so i know that there have been um stephen king um film uh film festivals where it's nothing but these short as you said 15 minute student films adapting his various short stories over the years and those would be kind of interesting to see and i know the long walk is one that a lot of people have adapted because again it's a very simple one to do it's just people walking down a road basically so yeah, it, uh, for for a student filmmaker in particular, uh, it would seem to be uh, ideal. But uh, I, I thought I'd mention to you, that's one to look forward to, if you want to look forward to something. Again, no trailers are out according to the Wikipedia page. Uh, the, the filming is expected to wrap up this month, basically. Um, I... What one one thing I always mention to my students, uh, I did teach Dr. Sleep the 2013 follow-up to The Shining, I did teach Dr. Sleep as a as a special topic course. And I in that course, I made a special point of acquainting my students with uh, Stephen King's book from 2000 on writing, a memoir of the, of the craft. Uh, and I, I recommend it to people t today, but particularly students. Um, I, well, that's the um, second one he's done. Yeah. Didn't he do also Dante Macabre is his earlier one? Yes, on? yes. Uh, uh, um, this one uh, came out in 2000. That means it at, at the halfway mark. Okay, it's informed by his accident in 1999. Uh, this accident was life changing for him. He was hit by a van on a rural road, and uh, he was walking along reading. You might say that that that's a risk taking behavior, but he was walking along the curb up a hill. Okay. Uh, reading and he and there and there was a drunk driver in a van who was off off on the uh, uh, on the side of the road driving along and hit him and uh lifted him up in the air and he's he had life-changing injuries and it if anything um had his there's probably nothing else that has had such a significant impact on his writing as his injuries. Uh, they they came to inform a lot of his topics and changed a lot of his focus. I think in many ways, he became a much better writer for for his accident. Now, I love on writing. That's uh, one of my favorite nonfiction books, actually. I, I love that book. I do have Stephen King. I've got a I've got a criticism for you. Adverbs are fine. Oh. <laughs> he has a whole section of that book about how much he hates adverbs. And I just read that thinking like they're fine. You use them. You, like there's there's nothing wrong with a good adverb, okay? They're fine. I'm sorry. That's I know it's not even tangentially related to the fact that the, a lot of that book is related to his accident and how much it uh completely changed his life. 
the, I mean, there are other like his his um uh his struggle with substance abuse that was a major thing that that informed a lot of his writing as well. Like there are yes. stages in his life, and that was a really big one. So much so that it, he wrote the <laughs> the driver as like the um and an unwitting agent of this like dark chaos god in the dark tower <laughs> like that driver was uh spoilers for the dark tower i guess no that's okay but um yeah so that driver was sent by the like the main overarching villain of all of stephen king's works to kill stephen king before he could finish the dark tower <laughs> and and stop their world from having an ending so it, in more ways than one, it really did inform his writing because he he learned how to hate someone. <laughs> yes, I, I, in fact, I, I really feel like I misspoke. Uh, there are really two things uh, of equal importance um, in, in in terms of his writing itself, and it's his overcoming his addiction. Uh, he says he has a hard time. He says he has a hard time remembering some of the things he's written uh, because he. Was uh, was so addicted. He one uh, here's one way of uh, one way of putting it is uh, he couldn't for a long time he couldn't imagine writing sitting down to write without a cigarette, and then he then he found it a hard time imagining sitting down to write without a cigarette and a beer, and then he, <laughs> then it became he could not imagine sitting down to write without snorting cocaine, <laughs> and. Eventually, he could not sit down to write without snorting cocaine as he wrote to the point that he had to start stuffing uh, cotton balls up his nose because he was bleeding. Oh. He's bleeding on the keys. Uh, so uh, and of course, his family did an intervention, which must have been interesting. Uh, so uh, now now it is interesting. Addiction is uh, a big part of what he deals with the 2013 uh doctor sleep okay it's all about addiction the shining especially yeah uh, and during the shining right during the writing of the shining he was an addict okay present tense whereas as of uh 2013 and um doctor sleep he is a veteran of AA and doctors, Dr. Sleep is the AA book, as I call it. It's all about, it's all about AA. And there's a story in uh, the recent collection, You Like It Darker, that makes fun of L, of, makes fun of AA. If there's, there, okay, he's more than happy to criticize AA, but AA is a big part of his recovery. Um, but the, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's profound to think about, well, just how addicted he was and for how long, well into the 80s. In fact, uh, I'm not sure if he wrote the Tommy Knockers after he recovered. I think he might have written Tommy Knockers. I think that was his last addicted book. It is because he's talked about the fact he doesn't remember writing that book. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh the one that I'm familiar with is that he doesn't remember writing Cujo. Yes, that book that's is... actually that. I, I think that title keeps changing. The, the book okay. I don't remember writing. Well, I know that he's he reread Tommy Knockers at some point. It was really upset with it because he goes, "This is just awful. Um, I can't believe I wrote this." So I may have gotten those two mixed up. Uh, uh, uh but uh, addiction and life changing injury. Okay. Uh, living in physical pain, the, these these issues uh, I think informed his writing and only made it deeper, only made it more profound, and less a case of trying to achieve an emotional effect, and more a case of having something to say. Okay, and uh, there I think um, these short stories, by comparison to the Skeleton Crew. That's this short story collection I remember from the 70s. That's how old I am, everybody. Okay. Uh, I remember when it came out. Okay. I bought these paperbacks at the newsstand. And you're probably people going, what is a newsstand? <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I, uh, I, re I remember these books. I, I remember looking forward to the Stanley Kubrick movie, having heard nothing about it, thinking, wow, I'm going to go see The Shining. And Stanley Kubrick is going to reproduce all these great things from the book. In other words, hedge lions, uh, 
the uh, hedge demons. The hedge lions, you know, the hedge creatures that come alive in the book. And of course, uh, nothing like that is in is in the movie. Uh, and it was hard to appreciate the movie at first because Stanley Kubrick made it his own thing. He, he told his own story. Uh, and today I appreciate them both. Uh, I appreciate both of them. They both have something uh, good going on. Well, but, let me ask you yeah. something, Peter, before um, where our time runs out. Oh, okay. Oh uh, this is something I wanted to ask you as well, because it's something you've done with a lot of your classes. A lot of your classes, you deal with book to movie. I mean, a lot of your classes. And I was just wondering why that was. Um, what appeals to you about doing um, book adaptations into film? Well, in the Dr. Sleep class, I encourage students uh, to go on YouTube and find certain scenes. For instance, the ice cream scene where Halloran, played by Scatman Carruthers, and little Danny Lloyd as Danny, Okay, are sharing a bowl of ice cream and talking about The Shining. I encourage them to to go and look at those scenes and uh, and compare them. Uh, so I I think comparing a book to movie is productive. And I'm I'm teaching Tolkien this fall, and I'm a, I'm not mandating, but I'm encouraging students if they want to talk about and compare scenes in, in The Lord of the Rings, the book, with Peter Jackson's movie, uh, that's that's completely okay. There is a tremendous video essay about the, the Bakshi Lord of the Rings movie that I, I would also encourage your students to watch too. Uh, that Just the production of that movie and the, the struggles that went into it is just, it's almost a, a better story than the production of the Lord of the Rings movie, like the live action ones, just because like, those those had struggle to them, but like this movie has problems. But it's still like it's the first attempt at a Lord of the Rings. Are you movie. talking about the animated movie the from anim the seventies? Yeah. yeah, the animated one with rotoscoping. It's uh, okay. I saw that uh, when it came out. I would not suggest your students. Watch I'm not that. saying. I'm not saying. I saw it when movie. it came out too. Don't watch the movie. Watch this. I I think I can't remember what the channel is called. Ask me in my office. I don't know, I guess. But um, just the how many difficulties came with uh, Ralph Bakshi trying to get this movie produced after uh, he did. Uh, I can't remember the other movies he did, but he did a bunch of adult oriented cartoons in the 70s. And that's kind of what got his most infamous one that he did. Yeah, yeah that that's the that's the big one. But uh, he did some other ones that were uh, Wizards was the one the wiz that he did just before it. Yeah, um, he was he's well known. He's a well known producer. <laughs> American yeah. pop. It's another good yeah. one. That's, that's, oh, that's, American pop. Okay. American pop is what he considers his best film. So yeah. Oh, okay. But yeah, this my favorite point. from him is actually um where he teamed up with um Frank Frazetta and did Fire and Ice. That's my favorite yeah. of the doctor. Yeah. yeah. Uh I I think that American pop is basically uh, uh an American tale if the people were human and not mice. <laughs> okay that makes sense but then again american tale is also a, a wonderful film so um but yeah you, your students may also be interested in in taking that film as a source of inspiration for some of their comparisons as well um or just looking at the just watching the film essay that i was mentioning <laughs> um can i talk about my week um, oh sorry well, say, really, i knew um, when you said i'm gonna let you go first i go that's a mistake that was a mistake yeah well <laughs> no 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 because this you you actually answered a lot of the questions i was gonna gonna have for you especially in talking with like your lord of the rings class i i did want to ask you um do you have challenges in finding like maybe not even finding but just teaching more modern material like are there things that you yourself are like it's teaching stuff that's I mean, you talked about Princess Mononoke before we started, and that's not a recent film, but like in the considering you also teach a lot of English courses, literary canon goes back so long, and you're teaching stuff that relatively is a little more recent. Like, do, is that something where you find yourself vetting those sources as well and have difficulty with that? Or is it just like whatever seems cool at the time? No, I, I, I think you're on to something. I, I find it very difficult difficult to make these to to make these decisions i think about them for years at, at a time um there there uh there was a time when i would 
uh, run the other way from teaching anything to do with Stephen King. It just just would opened up a can of worms, as they say. And I, you know, I always would ask myself questions. Well, if I'm going to deal with Stephen King, am I going to talk about his addiction? Am I? It, how much is that going to be part of the discussion? Would that be distracting? So when it comes to people who are more recent, it's it's. It's always been difficult for me to to make that decision. Uh, Ryan is a veteran of my of my <laughs> of my tortured thinking about things. We we have uh, collaborated uh, a couple times now on a Lovecraft course, and he knows the Sturm und Drang uh, uh, that I go through. The, the deep. I think I think our our last <laughs> class was fantastic because I think it addressed a lot of those concerns. Because why, you know, again, your concern was, why should we teach a class about an, a 100-year-old racist? I mean, you know. I mean, I uh, I remember um, for one of my, when I was an undergrad, um, I suggested to one of my professors foolishly that um, she should look at teaching the rats in the walls for no reason other than I thought it was a nice story. Well, it, it was an interesting story, but... Um, she looked at me and said, of what value would that have to teach in a literary class about like about literature? And I was like, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, so that's always something that stuck with me as well, where it's like, uh, well, of what value does it have? And sometimes the value doesn't have to be that it's this amazing piece of art that it's just, it's just part of someone, a, a part of an author's life, a part of their writing. Well, th th suffice it to say, it's not on a whim. Usually, uh, as 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 Ryan can testify, um, the uh, the the Lovecraft course that we taught uh, this past year was years in the making. And in yeah. fact, in 2018, we did a version of it where we saw all the places where we could make it better. We could make it a better course. It's like we had to really do it once and not do it to our own satisfaction and then talk about it for five years or, or really longer than that, really going back and forth. I, I, think it, I, I think people would be surprised with how much deliberation goes into a course that's not – Early English literature one, <laughs> early English literature two. <laughs> those are those are fixed. Those are those okay. are in place. <laughs> I, I I admit, uh, not as much Sturm und Drang uh, goes into if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, not as not as much um, uh, vexing uh, thinking uh, goes into those uh, decisions. And though in that case, I'm always looking for what's most feasible for the students. Um, but if if to to bring Stephen King um, into a course to make Stephen King prominent, I did teach Doctor Sleep, and years years went into that. Be, uh, be I, I remember reading Doctor Sleep, and one of those airplane paperbacks. You know what I mean by an airplane paperback? It's tall and thin. I don't know why airplane books must be tall and thin, yeah, sort of but thin. but they're in that they're in a paperback that's tall and. Thin. Uh, and uh, I, I read that uh, on on the plane, um, and uh, and it 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 was fun. But you know you know something. There's something about Stephen King that rewards reflection. And it was really re re. Hey, this is a motif uh, during our conversation today. It was rereading Doctor Sleep that made me start thinking about you know what it could be possible to teach a meaningful literature course uh, uh, with Stephen King uh, and and some of the scary things um, after reading on writing a memoir of the craft which I came to late uh, compared to a lot of people I a lot of people I, I didn't come to it until you know like a few years ago uh, and, and I thought you know I could talk about Dr. Sleep and talk about on on writing, and I think we could have a a, a serious course. And I, I could also bring in uh, the Kubrick movie and invite students to connect and talk about that. You know, um, so uh, just like I'm inviting uh, the Tolkien students 
to talk about. Again, not mandating. Okay, it's difficult to mandate some things, and and I and I realize leaving it up to the student, you know, has a lot of advantages, but but it is interesting that I have to go through this thinking process, okay, before I I launch out, you know, um, and it's really wonderful uh, that Moffat Library. People like you, Chris and, and Ryan and Joseph, it's really wonderful to to have you guys as part of a team because uh, Joseph Joseph made the course possible. He actually cleaned up uh, the the captioning, and I and I'm telling you, that's important. What captioning is that? Okay, uh, well. We made some videos, Ryan and I made some videos looking at specific stories and talking about them, picking out scenes that would be describable. Uh, and um, and uh, the, the captions, of course, well, they're machine made. And so Joseph really made the difference there. And I just really appreciate the team of Moffat Library. It, it's because of you that I have offered the Tolkien course. It's because of you that I've offered the Lovecraft course. It's because of you that I've uh, offered the the, uh, the Stephen King course. A, a lot of what I've done in the last five or 10 years that's off the beaten path, I have to admit, you should have heard me. I can remember me talking to people saying, I'll never do a Stephen King course. Okay, okay, the idea of a Tolkien course, Oh, oh, I mean, just, just, I, I, and now it seems hilarious, right? You know, now it seems like, well, what was my hang up? Well, you know, the thing that made the difference was having other people to work with. And Ryan and everybody here at the library, you guys, you guys make a difference. And I think you underestimate the difference you make uh, every, every day. You, you, you make a difference. And it, and, it, and it means a lot to me. Well, thank you, Peter. That means a lot to me hearing that. Too. Well, we're getting towards the end, so do we want to wrap up? Yeah, sure. Um, Joe, did you want to talk about what's going on in the community? Yes, I will do that. Um, okay, uh, we should probably go ahead and mention, although, well, the the fact the fact that you and Peter are there in uh, Mustang's studio, uh, which is a podcast recording facility that is located here in Moffat Library, and it is available for use by current faculty, staff, and students. And there's more information about it on our website. Look look at this thing. Look look at this. Listen to it. It's so nice. Yeah, we. We have headphones. It's nice. There's a control board right over here. You can't even see the control board. It's really nice. You should come in and see it, yeah. please. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Moffat Library is hosting Therapy Dogs on August 27th from 5.30 to 7, and on August 28th from 6 to 7.30. Uh, Stage 2 Dinner Theater is performing Steel Magnolias. You can join the Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas for workshops on Dry Point. Free and open to all age groups, Dry Point workshops will be from 5 to 7.30 on Friday, August 30th, and from 1 to 4.30 on Saturday, August 31st. All supplies are provided. Downtown Wichita Falls is hosting the next After Hours Art Walk on September 5th. The next WFMA Live at the Lake Arts at the Pavilion will also be September 5th from 6.30 to 8.30. You can enjoy live painting by Natalia Hernandez-Pagan, a performance by the MSU Texas Music Department, an art activity for the kids, and food vendors. So bring the family for a fun evening by Sykes Lake. Uh, that is a free event open to all. The downtown Wichita Falls Farmer's Market is hosting Taco Fest on September 21st. Also on September 21st, Backdoor Theater will be having an evening of improv. 
Uh, we promised Backdoor Theater that we would mention that. So this is us mentioning that. Uh, looking a little bit further ahead, uh, Rooftop Heroes are a pop culture mini convention celebrating fictional heroes in all their forms. Will return for its second year at Moffat Library on wow. 30, October 31st. We will have speakers and presentations all afternoon and a costume contest to close out the event. And a costume? Did area. you have that last year, a costume contest? Yeah, we did. It oh, was, you did? Uh, okay. Yeah, we did. Uh, yes, uh, and had some really good competitors, and we're hoping for more and better this year. Uh, we'll have a vendor area with student organization fundraisers. Uh, campus artists will display their work in an artist's row. For more information on participation, uh, call 940-397-4091 or email me at joseph.mcneely at msutexas.edu. And then just a little bit further in the year, Moffitt Library will be celebrating Children's Book Week with daily readings Monday, November 4th through Sunday, November 10th. If you'd like to have more information about any of those things that I have mentioned today uh, and other local activities, check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And of course, if you have an event that you would like for us to announce, or if you have any comments or suggestions or questions for any or all of us, please send us an email to uh, library at msutexas.edu. Well, all right. Do you have anything else to add? Well, I, I just want to, you, you know, I, I don't think, I do not think, Thank you guys enough. You, you you have made a difference in in my uh, in my survey class. That's early English literature one. Okay, <laughs> he uh, for uh, for Paradise Lost you substituted, and you did I, at my request you did uh, the Gnostic the Gnostic model of good and evil the Gnostic pantheon, and it was I, it was fascinating to me the responses i asked people to write responses and they got it they seemed to understand where you were coming from i didn't expect that at all oh. wasn't that amazing it was, the response it was yeah really, really fantastic i really love doing that yes and so you guys come through for me and, and, and in a way that um i try not to take for granted i i I, I, I try to stop and think, wow, what would I do uh, without Moffitt Library? And uh, you guys, you guys have been part of a creative process, uh, a creative process, and I, and opened me up to things I would not have otherwise considered. That, that means a lot. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's that that is something. Actually, I have a friend who just. Um, who just got on as a I think a math professor in like Washington or something. And uh, uh, he said, what's the first thing that I could do to really ingratiate myself? And I said, go talk to the librarians and tell them you want to, to have their involvement in any way and they'll love you forever. Oh, <laughs> and he said, Oh, I'll be there day one. It's but cre cre creativity is a, creativity is a topic I was thinking about before I walked over here. Cre creativity um that's something you and i chris have talked about before just what is creativity and what promotes creativity uh, uh david lynch uh, as you know there's some bad news about him he, he has emphysema and we forget oh yeah he's mortal he's a human being i guess yes and uh um he might he might pass away sometime soon uh i don't think he's planning on it no. but uh but you and i have talked about david lynch and creativity the big fish that's what he calls it You're, there's always little fish that you can catch here and there but you will want to catch the big fish that's the big idea the big moment of creativity um and that's just hearing that before uh, it's been so long since i've heard him talk about that but that's that's been a really influential thing for me is just the idea of like you're always going to have something creative something come up but when you get the one that's a big moment of creativity you want to catch that one you want to hold on to it you want to do something with it yeah, if I, if 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 there's something I could, if there was only one thing I could inculcate in students, it would be a love of creativity. 
No particular topic or, or particular major, okay? It doesn't have to be English, okay? Uh, the, if there's something I could communicate to them that, would, that they would remember and hang on to, it would be appreciating and cultivating creativity. Yeah, you, I, as from what I, the way I understand it, you professors, uh, all of you, all, <laughs> I, all of you, all, all you of people, you, you uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but there's, there's an idea that like going by the books and going by the stuff that's tried and true, that gets, that gets good grades or whatever. But what you really appreciate is seeing the students who think outside the box and who really put that effort of that effort and that creativity into their own research. That's, that's what you really like to see. Yes, and I don't think students believe us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> even now, if if there's a student listening to this, they're thinking, "Oh, that's a lot of malarkey." Okay, they they uh, professors have a preconceived idea of what the answer is, and and they want it parroted back. And uh, but it, it uh, I I know I know I'm guilty of inconsistencies. Um, there's a part of me that wants students to have an answer. Definitely. And so I come equipped with one. Okay. Well, what should, what, what does a paragraph look like? Well, I have a paragraph model. Well, what, what is your prompt question? Okay. Uh, and so I, you know, I tried, I try to have something. Well, what, what would be an example of an answer to that? I mean, students want those things. So I feel like I should, have those as a kind of service, you know, my value menu, right? <laughs> McDonald's has a value menu. Uh, but uh, I have a value menu uh, of answers and preconceived things of the box, as you would call it. But the truth is, you know, and, and this is hard to communicate. I'm not alone. Uh, most professors I encounter, most teachers I encounter, what they really want is for students to come away with a process. They don't want them to come away with a box of answers. I, I was at a math conference a few years ago. This is pre-COVID, a math conference over here at Bolin. You might have been uh, as well. Uh, and they had a panel of former students. And one of them went to um, a doctoral program and got a doctorate in math. In mathematics, and he's and he was working for a bank as part of a team troubleshooting various issues, and he and he said, you know what I understand now that I didn't understand as a student. When I was a student, my professors talked about the unimportance of answers, and I never believed that. I never understood the significance of, you know of avoiding answers. What's the problem with answers? I always felt, he said, that there were answers and I, and I was going to be about the answers. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I had this student in, 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 in one of my freshman classes so sharp. I made him my assistant. Okay. And he would walk around and answer people's questions. Okay. It was in a computer classroom. And so he would walk around and and answer their questions. Okay, so I mean, he he was very very sharp. And so hearing this confession from him, I thought was so instructive. Okay, and and he said the truth is, okay, the the most profound experience I had was realizing there weren't answers to the most important questions, and it was then and only then that I really began to learn. In other words, he got through his entire <laughs> experience at Midwestern and he looks back at it as merely preliminary to the graduate program and the job where he learned wow having a bunch of answers isn't much use if, if you're always if you're trying to find an answer though I feel like you're you're never going to be satisfied with it you're, you're always going to be like okay well what's the answer to that okay it's this one all right then that whole question just becomes meaningless then you move on to the next question and you try to find an answer for that one and you just going to keep continuing to to look for answers and looking for questions that, that have answers just for your whole life well i get where he was coming from in a way in a way it was also a self-defense for why he was the way he was let's face it up to a certain point there are plenty of answers out there <laughs> there are a pile 
pile of them. Okay, okay. Answers, answers are everywhere. And for an undergraduate, they just seem to be endless, right? Uh, and, you know, so, you know, you know the, the basically students would say, well, we could be forgiven for thinking there's an answer to every question because there certainly seems to be. Okay, at the at the undergrad at the undergraduate level, but it is interesting. Okay, what what we're trying to do, what Moffat Library is trying to do, okay, uh, is communicate a learning curve, a way of taking on the world that is creative and prizes the imagination, and doesn't rest with what we already know, but prizes a sense of possibility. You know, and I and I've always, you know, I've often thought, well, you know, that's been my experience at at Moffitt. My nickname, I shared this with uh, somebody. Uh, I said I think of the library, Moffitt Library, as the good place. Okay, the actual good place, not the one in the in the Netflix series, which turns out not to be the good place. Okay, but you guys are the actual good place, and I and I think a, a lot of students realize that you are a, a study mecca uh, the library has become the center of so much that is going on and i and i think it's in the brick here you know the sense of possibility and the importance of the imagination and the importance of of creativity i think that's what you guys are all about and that's something you've shared with me okay i'm really gonna have to cut you guys off now we're a good 20 minutes over at we this are point, quite a um, bit over. I was just about to say that actually. Well, I, I, I think it was a mistake sticking you and Peter in the same room together. That's all <laughs> I'm going to say because both of you love to talk about things. And what you've done is wonderful. But again, um, Joe is going to have to put this in, 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 in into closed captioning and it's going to take him forever. So, oh, that's I think we right. Should, we need to, oh, we need no. to stop now basically before oh, he no. spends the next five years. Okay, okay. To. Ryan's saying his thing, but this is what's happening. We've been put into free speech jail because we had too many ideas. We've been too creative in here, in here, in this room, <laughs> the podcast studio, which fosters creativity. So that's what we're going to continue to do. We are going to continue being creative, and um, that's fine. That's fine. We're you never going to stop continue talking. being creative as you want to, but I think we need to end the podcast at this point. You two can continue talking for as long as you want. <laughs> it's time to end this podcast. Thank you all for listening, especially if you made it this far. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be around next month for another new installment. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. We really appreciate it. We oh, it's it. it's an honor and privilege. And for everyone else out there, we will see you later. Bye.